everyone, you are very welcome to the second panel discussion that we ha are having in our Let's Get Connected week. Um, my name is Amy Kelly and I work at Let's Get Talking and uh, today's conversation is all about youth mental health. I think we can all agree that it has been a very challenging year on the youth um, of our country and they have showed incredible resilience in uh, what they've had to deal with over the past year uh, we're facing now. Um, and I suppose there's been many things in relation to minds, milestones not being celebrated, uh, socialization at the most important time in your life um, not happening in the way it really should be. Um, and of course, the education pressures that we've been seeing and facing over the past few months. Um, and I suppose to discuss that impact and I suppose provide some tips in relation to supporting uh, mental health of the youth of this country. Uh, we are delighted to be joined by Grace Harrison, who is a psychotherapist with Let's Get Talking. Thank you so much for joining us, Grace. Hi everyone, it's lovely to be here today. And we are also uh, delighted to be joined by Matthew Ryan, who is the welfare officer with the Irish Second Level Students Union as well. So thank you so much, Matthew, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so I suppose to start us off, uh, we are actually have a presentation um, that Grace is going to bring us through and then we'll have that open discussion uh, later on. So I'm going to share the screen now with you. So hopefully all goes well. Grace, you can let me know if you can see everything OK. Um, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, OK, great. great. Fantastic. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, and I'm going to take us through a presentation just looking at, you know, how have young people's mental health been affected by COVID-19? And there's lots of different sources out there. There's different research that's been done in the last year that shows how young people have been affected. So I've taken a mix of these and I've brought them together in this presentation. And I'll go through that first and then I will suggest some tips for young people on how they can support their well-being, but also some tips for parents of teenagers and how they might be able to best support their teenager. So any young people that are watching, you might find as we go through how you've been affected that some of these things might resonate for you. And you might be like, that's nice to, to see that that's out there, that people are recognizing that this is what I'm going through. So the first thing that I found was there was a newspaper article that was published two weeks ago. And it takes us through 13 different students across Ireland who sent in in quite details um, how they've been affected by COVID. So I just took a quote from some of these different students experiences because I thought it really gets us into what it's been like, what it is like. So I'm gonna read some of these quotes out. So the first one, I find it difficult to ensure that I'm eating enough, that I'm sleeping enough and that I'm exercising enough. I feel like myself and many Leaving Cert students are on the verge of a total breakdown. The second one, I spend hours at a time in my bedroom trying to find books that are available online so I can write assignments, watch pre-recorded lectures, read long journal articles and attempt to organise group work. Everything is on you. I feel as though I am completing this college degree on my own. The third one, I'm finally old enough to go out and do things with my friends and instead all we can do is call each other. I'm watching my life pass by while I do nothing. The fourth one, I'm happy to comply with all the restrictions, but it's difficult to prepare for potentially another year of them, knowing that people in my age are missing out on two of the best years of our lives. And we go to the next slide. And we have a few more examples. I feel that students like me with major depressive disorder who have to take a pill every morning just to face each day have been utterly ignored and forgotten by the government. They don't care about us. I am resigned to failing as are all of my peers. I pay full price for my repeat year of study as I was unable to complete my year of study last year due to my mental health. I was in receipt of a full grant with maintenance. Now I have nothing. And finally, it's extremely lonely and isolating and to have the blame put on a full group when it's a small number of people breaking the rules is extremely demoralizing. So I suppose before we move into some of the research that's been done, you know, really, we're seeing a broad range of experiences here and impacts on young people from missing out on key stages of their life, being able to socialize, connect, 
find their identity to feeling quite disconnected from college, to feeling like you're essentially required to do all of this work at home alone and feeling overwhelmed likely with that level of work to figure yourself, but also feeling like, I suppose, groups that have been affected like people with mental health difficulties already who find it hard to show up when they had to show up to college to have to do this extra workload and to do that alone, the extra challenge that that brings, never mind the loneliness, the isolation, and I suppose the, the upset that young people are feeling that in the media they have been wrongly portrayed and that this is maybe some people who are breaking the rules, but there are a lot of young people who are actually complying and it's quite demoralizing to feel like they're being brushed with tarnished with the same brush. So we're going to move now into some of the research that's been done. So one of the studies was how's your head young voices during COVID-19. This survey was conducted last summer in July and the Department of Children and Youth Affairs, they did it with a youth advisory group and the Department of Health, Youth Sector and SpunOut.ie. So the main aim of this research was to understand the impact of COVID-19 on young people. They had a significant number of respondents, so 2,173, and they were 15 to 24 years old, representing every county in Ireland. So what did this research show? Moving on to the next slide. So there was four questions asked in this survey and I'm showing answers to two of them because these are the two I think that stand out the most. So the first one was around how they've, the challenges that they're facing. And all but less than 1% reported experiencing both major and minor challenges during COVID-19. And the most highly rated one was missing friends which in one way isn't surprising because that is what adolescence is all about, connecting with peers, figuring out who you are, being able to push out into the world, growing up. So the number one is missing friends, followed by health affected school and college problems, cabin fever and isolation and loneliness were not too far behind. So moving on to the next slide, they were also asked how was how are they feeling about the future? And um, we'll just go to the next slide, Amy. Thank you. Just how are they feeling about the future? And also, what is it that would help them to feel healthy and happy in the future? So it's hopeful to see that 37% are feeling optimistic, um, but not too far behind. There's anxiety, uncertainty, pessimism and fear, and they all rank higher than feeling excited and accepting. So there is a lot of people, young people feeling anxious, uncertain and pessimistic about the future, which is very understandable. And I mean, these results are from a study conducted last summer. So you can imagine maybe what would the answer to that question be now? this much further into lockdown and that further being extended to. Now, the number one thing that they said that would help them to feel healthy and happy was support to family and friends. So we're getting a lot of information there. You know, we can be the support to family and friends for young people to be able to get through and to feel more optimistic about the future. That follows then by no work or money problems exercise and healthy diet and regaining a sense of normality. So the exercise and healthy diet, we can do something about the no work or money problems. We probably need more support around regaining a sense of normality. I think that's something that everybody's trying to work on. So we'll go to the next slide. This shows two other studies that were conducted on young people to see how they've been impacted by COVID-19. So. NUI carried out a study with 4,000 students, and this was done more recently. So that's a bit more telling maybe about where we're at now. It was in November. Now they conducted a similar study in May. So it's interesting to see the difference in the statistics based on May and then in November, that bit longer in COVID. So the findings found the students were struggling more in November than in May, which we might expect. 33% of first years were severely depressed compared to 26% in May and 16% in 2017. 
So when we look at 16% in 2017 and compare that to 26% in May, it really shows us just how much COVID has affected young people's experience in college. So we're not just looking at young people here now, we're looking at third level students and how they've been impacted specifically. But then we compare 26% in May to 33% in November and the impact on first years is significant. And you can understand maybe why so many first years are feeling depressed when you think about the excitement of when you finish school and how you're going into what's to be a new environment, a new chapter of your life, but to be doing all of that from your home probably doesn't feel like it's a new chapter of your life at all. So then we look at third years and above, and they had the highest rate of severe stress at 32%. And again, when we think of, you know, anyone who's watching that's completed college, if you think of third year, you know you're coming towards the end of your degree, you know you're moving towards going out to be, become employed, and the impact of having COVID in your life and not knowing how you're going to fare out in your exams with the current situation, you can imagine that they'd be feeling a lot of stress and anxiety. You know what they were hoping for, dreaming about for their futures is now questionable. And then only 37% had a sense of belonging to the college in November compared to 58% before the pandemic. And I've italicized this purposely because I think that this is one of the key points that this research makes is that the sense of belonging that students have to their college is dwindling in many ways. Because, I mean, if we think of the quote, I think it was the first quote from the newspaper article with 13 students' experiences. They said that all of the things that they had to do from their bedroom and feeling like they were doing their degree alone, I feel like that really got to the heart of maybe what that statistic is highlighting. That a lot of students now feel like they're alone doing these degrees and that it's very hard to, to show up on a daily basis with that sense of isolation. So we're not just talking about isolation in terms of hanging out with friends and being able to go out and to, to have drinks or to go to nightclubs. We're talking about isolation from resources, isolation from your university, isolation from school, just on so many levels. I can understand then maybe why isolation is showing up as the key finding as the biggest challenge that young people are facing. And at that age of life, developmentally, that's what adolescents need to be connecting, connecting, connecting. So that brings me to the last study, which was done last year, and it was done at the earliest stage of COVID. So as you can see, these later studies show us a lot more and they probably seem more relevant, but I'm still going to mention this one. So the Centre Statistics Office, they looked at the social impact of COVID and that was done in April 2020. So very early on into COVID. So it was a sample of 360, much smaller, 18 to 34 year olds. But at that time, 42% reported feelings of loneliness. Again, compared to a much smaller statistic in 2018, 15%. 45% reported feeling downhearted and depressed. And there was an 80% 80, 80 decrease in the number who rated their overall life satisfaction as high compared with data in 2018. 80% is significant. And that's only in the space of two years. So just before we move into what the tips are that I would suggest for young people and parents, I'm just going to quote from Dr. Coleman Nocter, clinical psychologist. He's a child and adolescent specialist. And I think this sums up maybe one of the points I'm trying to make today. There is lots of concern about children falling behind academically. And a lot of the discourse is about what they are missing out on from that perspective. But a far more concerning issue for me is the impact of loneliness, disconnect and isolation. Children are social beings and learn through social interaction. The loss of this may well far outlive any of the academic progress. And I know he uses the word child and children, but that applies just as much so to adolescents. So it's not so much the academic progress, but we're looking at the impact of not being able to connect and how developmentally is that going to affect young people and is affecting young people, but into the future. 
and that needing to be recognised. So what can we do about it? So moving on to the next slide. Ah, I forgot about this slide. So that this just is the key points is really that the main effects on young people across those studies are loneliness and isolation, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, family relationship stress, struggling academically, and relapse in mental health conditions. And I say an example there, eating disorders, because that's something that's been highlighted in the media that I, there's been a 66% increase um, this year of the level of hospitalizations for eating disorders. Now, not all of that statistic represents young people, but eating disorders is a common issue for young people. So I'm just mentioning that. So what is it that we can do? So for young people, I'm sure any young people that are watching, you've probably gotten loads of tips already and seen blogs and seen things on social media, and they probably seem very repetitive. But I'm all, all the same going to just suggest a few little things and hopefully you might get something out of it that sparks your interest or is that a little bit different. So creating routines, I'm sure you've heard this before, but I always suggest to young people that I work with that if you can create a couple of non-negotiables for your own daily well-being, and that's very personal to you. So a non-negotiable for one may be very different for another. Sleep routines, exercise routines, eating routines, study routines, self-care routines, socializing routines, they can all help. Be mindful to keep it simple and don't overload yourself. So I suppose don't make your routine a should, a thing you have to do, but just one or two non-negotiables that support you. Set mini goals. This can bring structure and motivation to your day. You can share these with friends and make it a fun way to stay connected and to boost your mood. So that can be done maybe over WhatsApp. You might have a, little, a friend who you set a mini goal with and just that helps you break down your day into smaller chunks rather than maybe feeling like it's overwhelming that you have so much to do. And that goes for study as it does for smaller things like on a weekend, maybe it's hard to get up and out and to do things because you feel like, well, I've got no reason to get up. Well, how can we give ourselves a reason to get up? Celebrate the daily wins. So list three things that you feel you did well every day and you will always find them. And I, I think that one's very important because I think we need to celebrate the daily wins to be able to feel like what we do, do counts. And I, I guess, you know, in order to get somewhere, we have to be able to acknowledge where we are and where we're getting right now. So we don't get from here to here without being able to do all the little steps in between. And it's not really worthwhile to want to climb to the bigger goals if we don't feel like we can commend ourselves for the smaller things we do to get there. So that's an important one, I think. And the idea of listing the three things is, it challenges you to have to think about it, but you always find them. Join virtual groups. So there's Instagram book clubs, you've got WhatsApp 5K per day challenge groups to Facebook outdoor swimming groups. I suppose I mentioned different types of social media there and different groups, but the idea of this is to find a group who share your interest or set up one with a few friends so that you feel more connected. And it can be anything. Reward yourself regularly and self-care. So there is a lot, I guess, of messages and ideas out there that, you know, if I study for eight hours, every day that I'm going to get this or that, you know, and there's a lot of emphasis on quantity, how many hours I've done rather than the quality maybe. And I think sometimes we have to remind ourselves that taking the break actually makes us more productive, even though we think that if we take the break, we're breaking the flow. But I suppose there's a lot to be said for the walk that you go on and the time that you take to process that when you then come back to your desk that you may be inspired and you may work through something a lot quicker. So sitting in front of something without taking any space or breaks isn't actually productive, it's counterproductive. And then we come away feeling like I didn't achieve anything. So that's not really helpful. So I just mentioned here in that, you know, that it's important to take regular breaks, little pockets of fun to look forward to. And when you are doing things to reward yourself, try to get creative because I know it's that bit harder at the moment. It's not like we can just go and meet a friend for a coffee or 
we can arrange a night out. So, you know, maybe you want to bake a new dessert. You want to maybe cook dinner for the family and try something out that others can share in on the joy, enjoyment of. Uh, take on a DIY project, read a book you've always wanted to read, make a gift for somebody, take on a new hobby. And again, I suppose the idea of the virtual groups and setting mini goals with friends, it's that sometimes it's easier to, I suppose, reward yourself and to do these self-care things when you feel like you're connecting in with others to do it. So you can use that to your advantage in that way. And so the next slide, just a few more tips, and then we're going to move on to what parents can do. So try to get outdoors every day. And I know that's not easy. And I know that the weather that we have doesn't make it always appealing, but never mind how physical your activity is, even being in the fresh air and nature will refresh you. And I think sometimes we can get into this all or nothing attitude that, oh, well, if I'm not like actually working out, what's the point? Or, you know, and then in a way that really takes from it because it's, it doesn't matter what you do or don't do when you're out there, just try to get out and let the rest follow. Limit your screen time. So I don't know how welcome that suggestion is. It's hard. It's hard right now because everything is on our phones. But I guess there's an interesting neuroscience fact here for you that neuroscience shows that when we spend a lot of time on our phones, our brains actually have to work extra hard to activate the prefrontal cortex area here at the front of our brains, which is what we need to be able to focus and study. So when we're present here, we take in things a lot more and we're able to see the more abstract and how things interconnect. But when our brains are really on our phones, it's here at the back that we are and our brains have to work really hard to be able to come up to the prefrontal cortex to be able to focus. So then things take longer. Everything seems harder work. So if you can try to limit your phone use during the day until after your school day and reward yourself in the evening with it, it will make your day much easier. And then the last two points are around you getting support around how difficult this time is for you. So to be able to talk to your parents, they'll be relieved to know how you're feeling and that they'd much rather that than feel like you're struggling alone. But also maybe to help them to understand what it is that you need. And I think parents are always, I suppose, they're trying to do their best, but they're not always sure how to go about supporting young people. They think that maybe advising you because they don't want you to go through the pain you're going through is the way to go. But often I find that young people that I work with are saying they just want to be listened to. So I wonder maybe how can you tell mum or dad that, hey, I just need to talk. I'd love if you could just listen to me and just say nothing, please, for 10 minutes, you know, because then you're telling them how they can be there for you. If you don't want to talk, maybe you just want to have fun or maybe you do want to have advice on something. Just be able to say that. And then to use extra supports. So with all that disconnection from college or schools, how can you maybe reach out to the student counselling service in your university? Can you reach out to the guidance counsellor in your secondary school? And you're probably all aware, perhaps, of the phone number, the 50808, that you can text this number for free any time that you want to have a chat. There is also many online counselling and psychotherapy services, and many of them are low cost. So money does not have to be a barrier. And Let's Get Talking are one of those services. So hopefully there's something there that speaks to young people. And we'll move lastly on to tips for parents. So any parents on today, it's lovely to have you and thanks for taking part. And I know that it's a difficult time for you too, no doubt with working from home um, and also trying to be there for you, the young person in your life. You may also have other children and it might be hard to, to fit in the time for all of them really as well as trying to manage your own busy working day and your own stress levels. So hats off to you because I know it's not easy for you either. So these are just a few little tips. The first one is to set the example. So when young people see you responding to this challenging time calmly, it gives them a sense of security and an example to follow. So try to keep the family home feeling safe by keeping stress levels low. So for example, if homeschooling is causing friction, park it. 
I suppose what I'm saying there really is, you know, to allow flexibility, you're doing your best with what you have right now. So the idea of, say, parking, homeschooling, if it's causing friction, no doubt some of you have already been doing this, but it, the idea of it is just to try to keep things calm and just if things are becoming too much, then try and just mix things up a little bit and allow for that being too much right now and then coming back to it. So to in within that, you're not only keeping the home calm, but you're also setting the example of it's OK to feel overwhelmed right now. We're going to take a break and we'll come back to these things. And so the same goes for with parenting an adolescent, that if they're feeling upset that, you know, you can be there for them as best you can or let them know when you can be there for them if you're tied up with work and come back to them but to, to kind of be flexible with what we're expecting of one another right now at home. When home is not only home, it's also work, it's also school. So that links into lowering expectations. Try to practice compassion for your young person and equally for yourself when productivity isn't as high and emotions are fluctuating. Celebrate the little wins every day to boost motivation and enhance your parent-adolescent relationship. So again, it's like, you know, maybe the way that we are towards ourselves, as you know, as the parent, you might be saying, oh, thank God I got that done now today. You know, that maybe you and your young person can be celebrating each of your little wins today. So you might acknowledge the things that your young person is doing. You know, well done for persevering with the online lectures today. It can't be easy. Or, you know, well done for finding that journal article for your assignment, because I know it was tricky you spent hours trying to figure that out or, you know, so to try to get into their world a bit with them and to kind of be on their level with the challenges that they are meeting every day, but to celebrate the little wins that they are do they're making there, because I suppose all those extra things that they're doing are probably not being noticed and they're probably giving themselves the hard time for not knowing how to do it, even though really this is all extra stuff that they never had to do before. So maybe you can help them to kind of be compassionate towards themselves around that. And that will also build the closeness in your relationship. Acknowledge their feelings. So again, as I said to young people on the tips on the previous slide, this is about, you know, for them, it was to try to help them to tell you what they need. And for parents, it's to try to be able to listen to them and to validate how they're feeling. So allow them to vent try to listen and try to put yourself into their shoes before jumping in to reassure or advise and i think you know jumping in to reassure jumping into advice i mean why do we do that because we don't want the young person to go through the pain that they're going through and yet at the same time we know as older people they have to go through the pain that they're going through to be able to know how to deal with things to be able to grow so it's kind of just inviting ourselves into, in that space with the young person. How can I imagine what it's like to be in their shoes? Because that's all they really want. They don't need me to fix it. I can't fix it. I can't change COVID. I can't change what we're dealing with. It's not really my responsibility to make it better. But what I can do is help them to hear themselves and to find skills to help them to navigate it better. Let them guide you. So again, where I ask the young people to say to their parents what they need, I'm advising parents to ask their young person, what is it that they need? So do you want me to listen to you? Do you want me to give you advice? Do you want me to just have some fun with you to distract you? So maybe you can ask them and just that bit of communication to be able to ask, what are, my, what are your needs in this situation? How can I be there for you? A routine for everyone. So this, the idea again, as with young people with routines, is that a routine brings sort of an anchoring, a sense of security. And because this is such a big time of uncertainty, it can be helpful to have routines. Now, I'm in no way being uh, idealistic here. I know that it's not easy to have a routine, especially as the home is so many different environments now, and there's a lot of different people's needs and different spaces, and probably a maybe limited space where you wish there was more. But the idea of this is to try to organize a routine that suits the whole family, including your young person. 
and to create space where possible so family relationships don't become too intense. And that probably involves a lot of trial and error and maybe a change is day to day because maybe one day dad's working from home and the next day um, mom is and, you know, maybe one of the children is able to go to childcare, but the other isn't. And, you know, so there's probably a lot of changeability with that. But I suppose the idea with this is to, to try to maybe, maybe the parents want to come together um, or maybe they want to include the young person, but it's to try to kind of how can we best support everyone's needs in this situation so that there isn't too much intensity. And I suppose I'm, I'm maybe underscoring the intensity part because the intensity leads to fights, conflict, um, too much, I need space, I can't deal, I can't focus, you know, and everything just quickly becomes overwhelmed. So if we can kind of break things up a little bit and, you know, if there is a limited space, can one person maybe uh, take a break when the other person isn't so that they're getting a bit of their own space at that time? You know, so just to try to maybe do that on a weekly basis or revisit it in each morning. How are you going to go about things today? And of course, keeping it simple. This doesn't need to be extra work for you. It's meant to try to make things easier. So just that little bit of fore planning might make things, uh, I suppose, not have to come to a place of escalation. And then the last one, self-care. So parents need to self-care as much as anyone else. And I think you probably know that and maybe you hear that as well and are like, OK, but I don't have time to self-care. You don't know how much I have to do in a day. And I'm sure that is the case that it's very difficult to get time for yourself. But it doesn't have to be extravagant or time consuming. Even 15 minutes alone twice a day can make a huge difference, you know, just for you to get that breather time to yourself. And the idea of it is that by replenishing your own energy, by prioritizing yourself at some point, is that you're both modeling a positive coping behavior for your young person, but you're also strengthening your patience in managing the challenges of parenting. And those two things are both really important because I guess, you know, and this is just one other thing I'll add in for parents and, and that brings my, my part of the talk today to a close, but that, you know, Parents, I think, try so hard to be the best that they can for the young person. And I guess what I'm maybe saying with the self-care part is, you know, is to be to allow yourself to be a human being. And actually, that's nearly the biggest gift that you can give your young person, because when you do that, you're telling them that it's OK for them to be a human being. And then they are knowing that it's normal to have these upset feelings and it's normal to feel stressed out. And that it's that a good way of dealing with that is to go off and take some time out for yourself or to do something nice for yourself. So when children, young people see parents doing that, you're showing them how to manage life. You're showing them that it's normal to go through the ups and downs, but that a really good way to keep regulated, to keep kind of calm is to take to prioritize those timeouts for you. And you know there'll be parents who will say but that's so selfish I've got other things to be doing you know like that's not a priority I should be able to get on with things and all of that but what you would be doing in that not only is that serving you it's invaluable in showing your child how to manage emotions which is a lot of what comes my way and I'm sure a lot of other psychotherapists way is that young people not knowing I suppose number one that it's okay to have emotions but number two, that how they can manage them, how to actually deal with them and how to express them. So I suppose I'm hoping that that gives you a bit of permission to give yourself permission to do that. Um, so thank you for tuning in to my part of the talk. I hope you got something out of it. Thank you so much, Grace. Uh, that was very insightful, uh, really, really valuable information there. I'm sure everyone tuning in has definitely taken away some tips there. I was even writing down personally some of the tips that you're outlining, because I think no matter what age you are, I think you can definitely take tip away from what, what you mentioned uh, there in that conversation. Um, and I suppose going back to the earlier slides that you had, um, some really stark quotes there that you outlined um, from the research. Uh, so to bring Matthew in here, uh, to that. Um, did you agree with what you were seeing there in relation to the Irish Second Level Students' Union? Is that what you um, were seeing? Oh, 
Okay, sorry, he's he seems to have been muted. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, yeah, we, no, we I, nearly I, didn't have a technical difficulty. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with what everything Grace was saying there. I think especially the one point that kind of stood out to me was how you know young people often tend to kind of bear the brunt of everything. You know, it's oh, it's all the young people out socializing and kind of you know they're the reason we're still in lockdown, and that can be very, I suppose demotivating for students especially you know the large cohort of students are following all the restrictions so when they open up their phone and see another article about or another tweet or something about how young people are to blame then they're kind of sitting there saying well I haven't left my house in two months how am I to blame you know and then it's kind of like is everything I'm doing kind of for nothing is it is it is this a waste of time type thing which can kind of get very tiring and it, mm -hmm. it's difficult to kind of process that as a young person and kind of be you know okay fair enough there are young people breaking it but there's, there's people from every age group breaking it. It's not just young people. Um, most young people are following the restrictions. We're at home, we're doing online learning. Um, so yeah, that, that was probably the, the number one part from that that stood out to me. Um, and that was the main point. Yeah, I think what, what you're talking about there, I think what we've seen in the media when students voice what their concerns are during this pandemic, it's not necessarily about getting to concerts, going traveling, or all of these other things that we possibly hear from other groups. It's about your education. It's about being able to access and, you know, do what you're supposed to do and then be able to move on in your lives and, you know, have those milestones. I think, you know, that's important to highlight. And it's it's a real challenge, you know, for both uh, you as students and teachers. You know, this is a new environment of learning that you had never experienced before. Um, what, I suppose, impacts are you finding the, the education stress on, on young people currently? Yeah, so I suppose this is maybe a two faceted kind of answer. Like obviously there's there's the exam year students and then there's the, the non-exam year students. So I suppose the exam year students this year are facing a year unlike any other in history. You know, we, we don't know, and I'm a 16 myself. Um, so we, we don't know what's happened, or well, we know more slightly now. Um, but we, you know, we, we've been through it at the end of fifth year. We lost our three months there. Uh, and now we're going through it again. And it, it gets very monotonous and it's kind of same thing different day um, mm -hmm. and you know you wake up and you click onto your laptop and you click into google classroom or teams or whatever you're using and you into your classes and at least when you're in the physical school environment between classes you'd be getting up and you'd be moving to your next class whereas now it's you you click hang up and you click join uh, and there's no kind of mental break there it's kind of very yeah, one yeah. class straight into the other with no time to kind of wind down a bit between classes because usually in school you'd have three four minutes in between the classes um, when you're moving one to the other whereas now online you're already trying to maximize the time you have and um, because it, it's so much more difficult to teach online and I suppose with exam years this this year you know it, it's normal in leaving cert junior cert leaving cert applied to feel very stressed and anxious about your exams but add on top of that not knowing yeah. what's happening with your exams for three four five months and then trying to plan around that and trying to think am I even going to college what's happening with college you can't even think that far ahead because you don't know what's happening in, in two weeks time and um, so it, it's very unpredictable for students and you know in schools you know we focus so heavily on the academic side of things but, but no student is taught emotional skills or, or how to how to handle emotions like this and how coping mechanisms work and what works for you and you know we're taught our English Irish maths which is brilliant and you need that but you need to strike that balance too and it, it's definitely a problem we've had in Ireland for for generations you know we've kind of had an attitude of just oh get on with it it'll be fine type thing whereas we're realizing now and I think the pandemic has really brought that to the surface that you know it's not always going to be fine and we need to have those those I suppose supports in place for young people for all people and um, because we see now you know if you were to go try and find a therapist it can be very expensive and a lot of a lot of families can't afford that especially at the minute and then there's also the issue of they're just not being enough you know, it, it's very difficult. And then you have the referral system in schools if you go through your guidance counselor. That can be very hit and miss. It, it misses a lot of students. It's it's not structured enough. And it, it's, it's a huge downfall of the Irish education system um, because, you know, students are stuck at home now and we're all wondering, what can I do? I, I don't want to be feeling stressed. I don't want to be overwhelmed by school. I don't want to be sad all the time. How do, how do I fix that? And then that's when you kind of realize, okay, I've never been taught those skills. Um, which is why then, like Grace was saying, and everyone's probably sick to death of hearing the, the same, I suppose, tips and tricks, but they, they do work and it's about the basic things. And, um, you know, having your routine, having your set workspace, having your set relaxing space, you know, don't let your desk also be where you're eating your dinner and yes. where you're having your lunch, you know, have that separation because Grace mentioned as well, the home is so many different environments that are usually separate. 
now mix into one, it's important to try and keep those separate as much as possible. Um, because if you're doing everything at your desk, then your desk becomes your kind of life and you've got no separation from that. Um, or same with your bed or your bedroom or anything like that. So it's important to, I suppose, keep your, your different facets of life separate. Um, but it's also important to take some self-care. And there's a huge misconception that self-care is just bubble baths and you know things like that. Or it's not. Self-care is anything that you do to look after yourself. So that could be different for everyone. It could be anything from walking the dog, cooking a meal, Take, just literally taking some time off to mindlessly scroll through your phone for 10 minutes just to literally completely switch off from worrying about anything or thinking about anything just literally doing nothing for 10-15 minutes um, or doing something whatever works for you and um, so those are the kind of things students are, are, are struggling with at the minute and you know it's important that they're getting that information and you know guidance counselors in schools are absolutely brilliant but but there's only so much they can do online it's, it's, it's something that we need to look at when we do get back into education because, you know, we could have a situation like this again. So how do we make sure that our students, not even when there's a pandemic, just normally in life, move on knowing how to deal with their emotions and not having to figure it out by trial and error and, you know, we guesswork, you know, we need to have that actual, I suppose, information there. Yeah, like I totally agree with everything that you outlined. I think even, you know, what you had spoken there about, you know, not being able to take the breaks or allow, and I think both yourself and Grace mentioned it, and I think you can't emphasize it enough that it's so important to put time in the day. And, you know, I myself, I'm sure many watching are struggling with that because I don't know about you, but the hours just seem to be flying in the day. I think I'd seen a thing where it said that the weekend seems like a 30 minute lunch break. And I was like, oh my God, I identify so much with that. Because it just just flies so quickly and I think if we, if we can bring in a schedule into that day or the weekend or whatever we have in front of us that we we know what we're going to do but I think it can kind of fill that time for us as well and make sure we're taking those times out because they are so important I think with the the media that we're hearing now it's it's very hard to disconnect uh we, I, we do feel disconnected from human beings but because of that we're trying to connect in other means through social media and that um in relation to social media Matt you what are you finding uh, because like um grace had said as well our whole lives are online in particular for students um you know their whole lives are online their education is online so it's kind of going back to what you said a few minutes ago about creating new boundaries of a working environment when you're sitting at home what can you do or what would you, your advice be from the Irish second level students union around social media yeah so, so social media is one, is one of the very tricky ones especially at our age because you know it is our only way at the minute of contacting friends um, and keeping in touch with you know facetimes and snapchat instagram whatever you're using but th there is a fine line between using it and overusing it and it it's very important that you realize and it's different for everyone so it's very important that you realize in yourself when you're using social media and when you're using social media as a distraction maybe from other things mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And it's not easy. I find it myself, you know, it, it's so easy to lie down on the bed and you open TikTok and suddenly you're three hours later still on the bed and you've nothing done. And then it comes back to the feelings of, you know, I haven't gotten anything done today. You know, I'm, over, I'm overwhelmed again. And um, so it, it is very important to, you know, do the difficult things and put the phone down, turn the phone off, put on do not disturb, leave it out of the room for half an hour. And um, if that works for you, but it is all about what finding works for you. It, you might be a person that could have your phone next to you and you won't be checking it. Or you could be a person that phone could be on the other side of the house and you'd be running over to check it every five minutes. It, it, it depends on the person. Um, and it's not easy. And especially when, you know, we have no other outlets, I suppose, at the minute. We're looking for something to, I suppose, fill that with. You know, we've missed 18th birthdays, which happened during lockdown. So we're having their second birthdays in lockdown now. We've missed parties. We've missed socializing. You know, there's been so many 18ths, like I said, people turning 18. So then, you know, that opens up a whole new chapter in your life of things that you never could do before and um, you know going out to clubs and things like that which you just couldn't do before and now it's kind of like well, you can do it but you can't do it um, yeah. you know. right. and like anticlimactic it's kind of like exactly. oh, it's, it's just, something you were aiming and looking forward yeah. to and it's exactly it just leaves you feeling kind of kind of flat so you know it's it's very easy then to kind of open up social media and use that to just distract yourself from that and um, so so my advice is to be is to try and find that balance find what works for you it's going to be different for everyone you know your friends are all on their phones too so if, if you're if you're not talking to them for an hour they will be there when you get back you know they're, they're certainly not going to disappear everyone's on their phones at the minute and um, so it, it's 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 important and it's it's okay to put your phone down for an hour um, and like it comes back to self-care if you're going for a walk or if you have a dog or something and you're taking it for a walk 
maybe leave the phone behind for half an hour, you know, and clear the head, come back, or, you know, you can set up um, kind of like sleep times on your phone. So that do not disturb will turn on past a certain time. I find that really useful because then I'm in bed and my phone isn't dinging every two minutes, but I have it turned on that if, if someone calls me, needs me, it'll still call. And um, so again, that's what works for me, but it's, it's different for everyone. It's about yeah. what works. Yeah, I think that that's such a valuable information, though, that we can all take away from it, because I think like I had seen somebody had said recently as well, I'm like going on 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 Facebook or wherever and I'm just scrolling. and It's like a thumb exercise I'm doing. It's I'm not taking in anything. And it's kind of like that striking that balance between, you know, taking that time off just to, to switch off, but also not kind of being on it so much that that's all we're kind of finding with our time. So we're kind of going back to what again, what was earlier mentioned, bringing in the schedule. I think uh, putting a structure on our day is just so, so important. Um, I'm just going to have a look at and see about um, in relation to kind of some of the topics that were discussed there. Um, I thought it was very interesting, Grace, in relation to what you said, particularly around eating disorders. Um, I don't think we talk about that enough. Um, and I wonder if you could shed a little bit more light on that for us as well. Yeah, I mean, I know I mentioned that statistic. So the 66% increase this year on hospital admissions for eating disorders and you know, when I saw that, I was shocked, you know, I mean, on, on one level, I was shocked on another level, I wasn't. But I suppose I was shocked because I suppose that exactly as you said, Amy, it's not being talked about, you know. So, yeah, there's a huge impact on young people from COVID in terms of underlying mental health conditions that were there. Um, and then either them being, I suppose, relapses, so a relapse with an eating disorder or conditions coming to a head because they're just being exacerbated now during COVID. And I suppose, I mean, eating disorders, the way I understand them, it's a way to cope. It's a maladaptive way to cope. So I suppose if we're thinking of the current situation and how difficult it is to be able to withstand extensions, extensions, extensions to lockdowns, more uncertainty, not getting clarity, um, I suppose maybe less concerned for our mental health, maybe sometimes we feel from the government than someone with, say, an eating disorder. Well, I mean, if those, in, if those statistics are increasing, it's highlighting that the people who have them are finding it difficult to cope. So they're turning to food, they're turning to these restrictive tendencies. Mm. Um, it's a big issue with young people um, yeah. in terms of say the clients that come my way that would be aged between say 15 and say 25 in particular, a lot of young men and women who are mm -hmm. coming in with struggles with body image um, and food, their relationship with food. Yeah, I see you, Matthew, nodding uh, there. I, you obviously agree with what Grace yeah, has outlined. Yeah, when, when you're at, at home all the time, it's, it's, it's different because you don't have, you know, you don't have your schedule where you get up at eight to get the bus to go to school and then you're in school and your, your brain is kind of going. When you're at home, there, there's nothing kind of going on in the background to keep you distracted. So oftentimes people can relapse into something that might have been there before, um, as, you know, as Grace said, a coping mechanism, um, or they can kind of develop something to help fill that, I suppose, void that's left by the, the lack of structure in life. And, and we also saw um, that, you know, the, the cases of domestic abuse in houses has risen during lockdown too, because we're at home all the time. And they're, they're not easy stats to talk about. And it, it's very easy to talk about, you know, the stress and anxiety of exam year students. But during the pandemic, what would have been normal stress has turned into anxiety and what would have been normal sadness and overwhelm has turned into actual dep you know, depression. And it, it, it's not easy to talk about those things. They're not, they're not you know, fun topics, but it's important that we do have those conversations and that when we're, when we're in education, it, it, it's okay to talk about those things because the only way you can get information across and there's, there's no point, I suppose, beating around the bush with it because we know young people are going through it. We know that being at home isn't easy and that we are looking for those coping mechanisms. And sometimes they, you know, they aren't the healthiest of coping mechanisms. Um, so it, it's important that you know, we are talking about those things in an honest way that it is very open to students because it, it's what they're going through anyway. So they know sometimes more than they think they know about it because yeah. you know, they pick it up through social media. And like you said, when you're scrolling, you do pick up bits and pieces of things that you don't even fully read. You just see it and then you, you remember those bits mm -hmm. and pieces of information. So if you see a post shared with information about you know depression or mental health issues, you, you pick up more than you, you realize with that. So it's really important, like I was saying earlier, that in education, we're not just focusing on the academic because especially in second level, which is kind of like the, the in-between between when you're completely dependent on your, I suppose, parents or guardians mm -hmm. to when 
you're transitioning into college, that's where you kind of learn those, those life skills. And at the minute, the way we learn them is through complete trial and error, you know, nights out and things, you learn what works and what doesn't work. And um, whereas now we're not mm-hmm. having that, which is why it's important that, you know, the leaving cert, the junior cert teaches more than rewriting information yeah. on piece of paper and it teaches you kind of life skills. Yeah, like the school experience that, you know, it, it, it is like, it's kind of bringing back to what Grace had mentioned there that, you know, when you're t- when she mentioned about alone and isolation, it's not just, you know, uh, sitting at home or whichever, but it's, you know, your, your, your whole resources that usually are around you that in a way perhaps we may have or may not have taken for granted previously before the pandemic, but now we really can identify that we need them, you know, and they play such a huge role in, in our lives and the lived experience and what we get out of it. So um, thank you for that, uh, Matthew. To give you the final word, Matthew, uh, to look into the future and to look in, I suppose, in a hopeful way and in a kind of a positive way, um, what do you hope or what do you see for the, I suppose, the support uh, for, for youth mental health? But I think, you know, from the media, I think, as I said at the start, I think young people have handled themselves publicly incredibly well and showed incredible resilience uh, throughout this pandemic. And I think that's one thing that will stand and hopefully the positive in one sense is co- uh, co- coping skills um, that will come out of this that they may have learned. Uh, what else do you, do you see that as hopeful? Out of this? Yeah, so, so like you said, it, it's very easy when we're talking about the pandemic to latch on to talking about nothing but the pandemic. And I suppose yeah. let, let the glo- doom and gloom kind of take over, which it's not easy. But, you know, it is important as well to kind of look to the future and realize, you know, we are closer to the end of this than we have ever been. You know, we have the vaccines coming. It's and I know it feels like a long time away, but we are coming out of it. So it's important to remember that aspect of things, too, when we're talking about it. It, it isn't all doom and gloom. Um, but definitely, I think in terms of resources, um, there's there's a massive overhaul that that's needed in terms of mental health and um, I suppose services in this country. Um, and we, we are quite behind to other, I suppose, modern countries and, um, you know, students even wouldn't know where to go looking for help and um, so I definitely think from from the very top down from the government down from the Department of Health we need more funding towards the mental health sector we need more freely available resources there for students you know text 50808 is great we have a partnership with them you can text ISSU to 50808 if you ever need a chat and they're brilliant they can deal with a wide wide range of things anything from if you're just feeling stressed and overwhelmed to if you're going through an actual I suppose emotional crisis and then you have things like data house and, and all those amazing I suppose um organizations but what's happening is they're ending up taking i suppose the brunt of everything they're you know dealing with what should be dealt with through you know standardized governmentally funded and uh, i suppose programs because pieta house is brilliant but they are run on a voluntary you know i suppose basis so is five way to wait they can't i suppose deal with everyone in the country it's, it's impossible so we, we definitely need more supports in that area and uh, in terms of supports for students as well on the icsu.e website um, there, there is a few, I suppose, mental health manuals and resources that just help very written by students for students and um, kind of, you know, someone who's gone through it, sharing their tips. And um, there's a few bits and pieces about bereavement and things like that up on the website. And also then another huge thing with this pandemic has been uncertainty mm-hmm. um, and I, I definitely around, I suppose, education, what's happening. So, you know, the ICSU, we are holding an event this this Sunday, which is hoping to kind of dispel some of that uncertainty and kind of confusion for students. And um, so it's a bit of a town hall event where you can come ask questions about the recent announcements um, and, and get answers, which, which I think answers is what students are craving more than anything at the minute. And um, they, they really don't know what's going on and they just they need that clarity um, as, as to what's happening. So those are all, I suppose, the resources and things and what we need going into the future. And I, I definitely think the future is bright. I think coming out of this, you know, we have a, a good future ahead of us. And uh, I think, you know, college is just around the corner and the pandemic is, com- we're coming out the other end. So I think, you know, we are getting there slowly but surely. <laughs> Yeah, and I think like picking up on kind of the theme of what you've been saying, I think it's really important to remember, you know, although things maybe seem on hold now or we may have missed milestones, there's no set way to live your life. And I know that might sound very like philosophical to an extent, but I think we can individually put pressure on ourselves that I need to achieve such, such a thing by a certain age and all of these things. Um, but that doesn't happen uh, that way for a lot of us, uh, pandemic or no pandemic. And I think when we realise that and we just uh, do as best as we can, that's all we can really do. And particularly under these circumstances, uh, that's all we can do. Um, I'd like to thank our panel members uh, for their hugely insightful um, advice and conversation today. I found it very, very beneficial. I hope you uh, tuning in also did. I'm just going to share another graphic kind of uh, picking up 
there on what uh, Matthew had said, but here's just some um, numbers as well. If you'd like to immediately talk to anybody, there's some helplines available for you, or if you'd like to book an appointment with Let's Get Talking, our contact details are below there as well. Um, always remember, and I mentioned it at the conversation last night as well, that there are people there that are happy to talk to you, um, you know, and it, there's many ways you can do that, whether that be texting or talking to someone with phone or uh, talk therapy or peer to peer support groups. There's a wide range of facilities and supports available to you, but just reach out, uh, whether that be to a friend or a family member as well, to never forget. So thank you so much to our panelists uh, for again today. Uh, we'll be back with another live video this evening at 7 p.m. around the topic of isolation and loneliness. So do join us for that as well. Uh, we'll be able to bring you some tips in, uh, in dealing in those circumstances. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.